Welcome to the Gospel Coalition podcast, equipping the next generation of believers, pastors, and church leaders to shape life and ministry around the gospel. Today, we bring you a message from Dante Upshaw on race in a broken world. This workshop was originally held at TGC's 2018 Bay Area Regional Conference. Gracious God, Daddy in heaven, I love you so much. And thank you so much for loving me. So it's me, your son, and you've set in motion so many events placed in my path, so many people to allow me to be present in this moment right now with you in this beautiful room filled with your children, your beloved. So thank you for each of my sisters and brothers, many of which I've never met before. But for some reason, Daddy, you've uh, appointed the time for us to be together right now. All that you've been doing since the beginning of time and before you've allowed us a small window of opportunity to be here right now. And so mighty sweet spirit of God, we invite you and we rest in you to continue the work that you've begun in each of us. Your church for your glory. for The manifestation of your, the beauty of who you are. Will you please, in this time, continue to open our eyes and reveal to us the deep mystery of the gospel? We surrender and we'll trust you above what's natural, above what's comfortable, above what we don't even know. Thank you that you know all things. And We pray this prayer with great expectation in your name, Jesus, and the power of the Spirit. If you agree, say amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. My name is Dante Upshaw, and as your brother from a different mother, I just am glad to be here. Because again, as I've said, many of you I don't know, this invitation to join the Gospel Coalition for this conference is uh, an unexpected invitation you know one of those ones you get like really oh okay <laughs> my dear brother pastor andrew hoffman and my family from solano let me hit a little bit for solano out there <laughs> just like we practiced that was awesome guys <laughs> that was awesome uh, <laughs> <Woo>. <laughs> okay so let me get some workshop order stuff in place I, i'm i like to be interactive okay and a tad bit animated. Okay, so with that said, I'm going to be myself in God's strength and grace and mercy and power. And I'm asking the same of you. You're here. Be yourself. It's okay. You got to have that if we're going to talk about what we're talking about today. So with that and being here, I'm honored. Um. Again, for the invitation from our dear brother and the leadership of the coalition. Thank you for um, the invitation. Because they're committed and really believe that the subject that the Apostle Paul is laying out, the different subjects throughout the book of Ephesians are so important. And this one in particular, as we look at race in the new community, is central to the gospel. So I'm going to say that up front, you know, put my foot through the door and we'll catch up as to what that really means. Central to the gospel. I'm so thankful for our dear brother in this past session. I hope you were there to hear it, to hear what our brother shared. All of it. I feel like we have the chance now in this bit of time to dig a little deeper onto some of the things that he laid out about the new community and how that new community, the new humanity has been formed. And with that formation of this third race, because the two have now become one. So I found some helpful language and stuff. We're part of a new humanity, a new community, a third race, a created something special, just like 
God spoke into existence. Adam and Eve informed them. Jesus, through his blood at the cross, has shaped and formed a new creation. The church. A beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing. And we can get on that one and have many conferences about the beauty of that. And it just be all good. And people singing the songs. Miguel just playing. <laughs> My daughter just dancing, you know. And then we go back to our monocultural, monoethnic churches. We can read all about what John saw in that vision in Revelations, right? Wow. Revelation 7, you've preached it, right? You've taught it, you know? And then you look up and everybody looks. Mm. So what is it? What's the deal? Why are we having this discussion about race? If it's already done, right? If Jesus did it, what are we doing? So to go off the deep end in this discussion, I thought um, it might be helpful for you to have a little context about me as I share from the word and from my experiences and journey. Maybe it'd be helpful to have a little context. I'm a context guy. So as my brother Andrew and I have been journeying just recently, we've had some good conversation about stories, our stories, and how this Mystery of the gospel, mystery of the gospel plays out in our life. Because I'm trusting you, like me, have been radically transformed by the gospel, the message of the gospel. Right? And as a little boy, when my mama introduced me to Jesus, right? So you gotta understand, you gotta understand my mama. See, she had that crazy radical family broken busted and disgusted kind of journey and so when she meets this jesus her life is radically changed my stepfather introduced her to the lord and he was a young minister of the military and so their marriage when i was two was about dante having a solid family a godly family a gospel-centered family so she introduced me to Jesus. Revelation 3.20, man. Stand at the door and knock. Dante, Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart. I got that. You know, I'm, I'm getting that. You know, he wants to come in. You know, he, he wants to he wants to be your savior and your friend. And that was working for me because I'm like only kid. You know what I'm saying? Lonely, bored. Be my friend. You know, <laughs> I'm, sign me up, mommy. I'm good. You know, and I believed it. So I'm telling all my friends, I got a new friend, it's Jesus, and man, I'll walk through the house and I see my mom having communion with this beautiful God that she loved. She's making breakfast in the kitchen. I'm smelling French toast and some grits and stuff. You know, I grew up down south, and, um, and she's just smiling and singing. I'm like, Mama, who are, you, who are you singing to and smelling? Oh, it's just me and Jesus. I love Jesus. Okay, mom, strange. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but my home was saturated with this gospel love message, the music. I mean, my first gospel song, Jesus loved the little children of the world. Red, yellow, brown, black and white. They're all precious in his sight. Jesus loved the little children of the world. But as my journey kind of fast forward, I got confused. And maybe the song should be more like, but do people love the little children in the world? I mean, red, yellow, brown, black, and white, they don't, know, they don't seem to be precious in everybody's sight. Hmm. Because in my gospel center home, my gospel center church, I mean, I had a pastor, Pastor Herman Conley. He's with the Lord now. And he was for real about the gospel. And we were gospel quoting scripture, toting evangelical <laughs> church. And every Sunday, he made a way to get the gospel into the message. Jesus was going to go to the cross. He was going to die and raise. It didn't matter what the subject was. That was going to get preached. <laughs> For real. 
but there was still something that still bothered me because he was also at the same time when it would come up about race things in society he would be very clear to say that we're a gospel church we're not doing that social gospel it's foolishness I thank God for slavery. So I'm hearing that. <laughs> Get a little confused, like, okay. Hmm. Got really confused as I'm in this gospel centered school, Christian school, Calvary Temple, kindergarten through second grade. I'm there, and <laughs> one ride home on the school van, Alan turns to me. Fourth grader, I'm in second grade. He says, I'm better than you because I'm white and you're black. Hush fell over the whole van. Went the rest of the way in silence. I didn't know what to say. I don't know what that meant. What? What? That was my friend. What's... We get home. Obviously, the driver heard something because he dropped me off last and walked me into mama and asked me to, you know, Explain what happened on the bus today, Dante to your mom. So I told her. Alan said that he was better than me, mama, because he's white and I'm black. And I remember my mom trying to help me make sense of that. That was my first face-to-face encounter with this thing called race in the church. So I'm wrestling with this thing. I'm wrestling with this idea I found of this mystery of the gospel. This wrestling led me all the way to a point of wall impact. Mm. In high school, summer, going into my junior year, I'm a part of this summer enrichment program for disadvantaged kids, low income families, especially the first to go off to college. This is a great program to expose you, inspire you, and equip you to go to college. So I I go kicking and screaming, because who wants to spend your summer up in some classrooms? (laughs) Why are you thinking math and English? And then they had a nerve to put this African studies class required for some of the upper class students. So I'm like, really? I missed the first year, but the second year, mom said, you going to this program. You getting up out of this house in some time. <laughs> so I'm there. My whole class, we were from different schools in the area. So in class, our teacher is Mr. Umoja. This guy had the most radiant smile. African-American, super intelligent, calm as all get out because we were trying to get to his nerves. <laughs> What's this brother's button? We got to push it, you know, because we this is the early late 80s, early 90s, that time when black pride was not popular yet. But it was actually our generation that got things moving with the hip hop (laughs) movement and culture. But at that point, we were very resistant to the idea of being African. I ain't African. Because all the negative things I've heard about Africa, things that my pastor had said who was a missionary in Africa. Yeah. There was still this subtle hatred, self-hatred. So I'm the most vocal in class to Mr. Umoja because I got the gospel. I don't need that. That stuff Reverend King was doing, it's the gospel. So Mr. Umoja, in such patience, he just asked me questions about the gospel, about the Bible. And after about a couple of weeks, my head spinning, watched a few films, read the autobiography of Malcolm X. Yeah. I became one signature away from joining the new African Panthers. To this day, I don't know why I didn't sign the creed. I learned it all, brother, but I just accounted that the spirit protected me. But I'm in conflict, if you can imagine, with my mama who says, you know, all the children of the world, where you get this black, this black stuff from? I didn't raise you like that. I love you to love everybody. Yeah, mama. Yeah, you did. But will you please explain to me what I'm seeing? 
I mean, uh, is the gospel not strong enough, powerful enough to break some of this stuff? And why is there First Baptist black and First Baptist white? One Lord. Come, help me out, Mama. I'm trying to understand. Mm, well. Mm hmm. <laughs> That wasn't enough for me. I'm sorry. I'm the why guy. That was not enough for me. I need to understand. So I press and I press and I press. And <sighs> this pressing leads me further, deeper down this road. I end up leaving Atlanta, going to Chicago. And there I saw and experienced how the gospel was not only being proclaimed, but also demonstrated. And the ministry there really gave me some hope in my journey. But I continue to see over and over again around the country, the underbelly of the body of Christ. It's not pretty. They tried in the South to use the Bible belt to hold up <laughs> the belly, you know. <laughs> but it's shameful what's been done and perpetrated within the church. As our brother said, racism is an affront to the gospel, an affront to God. But we've tolerated and allowed and too often perpetuated this sin. A couple of stories as I transitioned, I want to share with you. Hard, but real. In 2016, there was a movie made called Birth of a Nation. Now, you might have heard about the original Birth of a Nation movie back in the early 1900s. But this one tells a story, dramatic story, of Nat Turner, who led a, the largest, though unsuccessful, slave revolt, 1931, in uh, Virginia. Now, Nat wasn't just your average enslaved man. He was a Baptist preacher who believed God had given him visions and dreams and a calling to free enslaved people at the expense of killing white folks. Mm -hmm. There's a scene in a movie that sticks in my mind. Nat and his master on one of his visits to a plantation, because he would be taken to plantation to plantation to preach the gospel to those enslaved people on that plantation. That was his job, his calling by God. On one occasion, he's taken into a barn, and the owner of the plantation is there with several enslaved men who are chained and bound and they have their mouths locked open because he's force feeding them. They're rebelling. One of the ways enslaved people would rebel in those times was to starve themselves to death. But this master wasn't hearing that. Y'all gonna eat. So he's force feeding them. And as to make it even better, he's chiseling, knocking out their teeth to make sure the food goes down. Nat is watching this with his master and they're in shock. The owner looks up at him and, you know, Nat's master makes introductions. This is Nat, he's a preacher. I don't want just as long as he gives them the gospel is what he says. And that's wrecking my brain. <laughs> I'm like, what, what did he just say? Again, all these years, I've been wrestling with this idea of how are we doing it in this to see that scene. Ah. Nat goes out and he's with now a group of enslaved folks from that plantation. And he, with tears streaming down his cheeks, begins to recite scripture. He was a very intelligent man, memorized most of the Bible, you know, so he knew the word. But can you imagine the conflict? In his heart, as he's looking at his sisters and brothers in chains, telling them to obey your masters. 
you know, verses that we know, right? Mm. The gospel? The gospel? And that may seem like, oh, that's extreme. You know, obviously that's wrong. That's just totally a miss with the gospel. But even in recent, I was a part of a very large church at one point, an elder on the leadership team. And if you recall back in 2015, um, a young 21-year-old white man walks into a Wednesday night prayer meeting in South Carolina, and after sitting with them for about an hour, decides to kill nine of them, the pastor included. They called him the next day, and his own confession, he was wanting to start a race war. You know, he was real. That's Wednesday night. So my heart, anticipating Sunday coming, like, how is this going to be addressed and handled? This is a national deal. Many are in uproar about this. That Sunday morning, to my hurt, it was not even mentioned during our service. Went home, my daughter, my wife, and I wrestling with this. What do we do? What do we do? I had to talk to them about the tree because they were ready to really go off. You know. I wrote an email that night for the leadership saying basically we missed it we missed it here was an opportunity for us as sisters and brothers to show empathy and compassion with other sisters and brothers and i don't understand why we didn't even acknowledge what had just happened in short got a few responses but the most enlightening was when i talked with one of the pastors on staff and hearing his take on the situation, the discussion that Sunday morning, the decision that was made and his personal thought was the church was a part of the a traditional African-American denomination. And so in his mind, he wasn't quite sure if they were even believers. I mean, do they believe the same gospel? And because of that conflict in him, I appreciated his honesty to say out loud what I found many to really think and feel in their hearts. That sometimes our theology has become a blind spot to our being compassionate to another person's humanity. Did it matter what denomination they were a part of? Did the fact that they were a part of God's image bearers mean anything for me to be empathetic and to pray for them, to weep with them, to lament the horror of this? Is the gospel not powerful enough? This is my struggle. This is my honest wrestling because I've heard the gospel message proclaimed so much. But in times when it's necessary for us to be present, not so much. Not so much. And I don't know where you've been journeying because we all have. We're all at different places on this journey of understanding the gospel implications in our lives. But there's one thing I want to say that I pray and trust will resonate with you or cause you discomfort till the spirit gives you peace is that there's something about the mystery of the gospel that we've missed. It is the it in all of this discussion. It's the it that people of color are wanting white folks to get when will they get it it's the it that white folks are wanting people of color to get over when will they get over it the it the it my sisters and brothers is the mystery of the gospel ephesians 
36. You got your Bibles. I invite you to turn there. So you don't think I made up a term. It's one of those social terms. No, isn't that? No. <laughs> it is what I believe our brother Paul was getting at. And I promise you, like so many things, something that I missed, miss, was mistaught, overlooked. I recently was reading a blog about the mystery of the gospel. And the writer of the blog in no way mentioned anything about race. He just kept the narrative about what Jesus did at the cross. Truth. But so short, so narrow. So here in the chapter, Ephesians. Because I just love the word, how it rings in our hearts. I'll begin with the verse one. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles. Now, that would be us, right? In case somebody up in here, Messianic Jew. Anybody? Swole. Hey. <laughs> bless you, sister. Oh, bless you. Yes. Oh. Now, for all of us others. <laughs> Assuming that you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. How the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I've written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men and other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the spirit. Verse six, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. When was the last time you heard a sermon break that down? I so appreciate what our brother just shared in that last section. But you saw he only he brought it up to the edge. And so I get to. <laughs> because you've heard it, we've heard it, we've sang it. We've taught it the gospel. Jesus Christ died for my sins because I was so wretched in need of a God. Need of salvation. I was buried, he rose victorious, conquering death in the grave. Ah, uh, and through that, now I have access to this loving, amazing God that I don't deserve. Hmm. And again, my pastor would preach that every Sunday and he'd get all he was a he's a big man. So he's got his robe, his, that robe on. and He get to shaking and crying and it's nothing, nothing cute about a big black man crying. <laughs> not cute, not cute. So I try to. I'm not doing a good job because I get a little emotional with my brother here. We're in touch with our humanity. <laughs> but it's not cute, you know, so we hug it and cry, you know, because we're so gripped by this love that is real. And if it doesn't touch you on that level, I pray it does. I'm not going to judge. I just pray it does touch you like that. But does this touch move you beyond that emotional experience to think about this horizontal part of the gospel. We're real in touch with this vertical thing, but it's here where it gets messy and sticky. It's here when it's talking about Jew and Gentile, black and white, slave and free, male and female, that the mystery gets really, really strange. And I get it now. I'm getting it. I'm still, it's mysterious that this works out. That a Jewish per and he described to us this relationship between Jew and Gentile. Those weren't just words. Paul uses words very carefully. Hostility. So that Jew Gentile relationship that he's describing in the text, if we were to modern day work it, it's like the hostility level that we see in countries where they're killing and hacking people 
you know, different tribes going at it with machetes. It's here in the West. The ugly genocide of native people. How this country stood military and a Cherokee. African-American and white folks. Hostility. That's the same intensity of this. And we're saying that the gospel has the power on this level. But I look at what's out there and I'm like, that's mysterious. (laughs) That's a mystery. But I think the messiness of the mystery causes us to shrink back into our silos and comfortable places. And I, I can work through and figure out this all day long and sing it. So I'm crying, but I don't know how to engage. My mom didn't have the words to engage here because all she had was a bunch of memories of being called a nigga and having rocks thrown at her when she was in Alabama. And that's why, baby, I didn't want to tell you those stories because you would turn just like you did just now. All bitter and angry. And I didn't want to be bitter or raise a bitter son. So I didn't tell you those stories. But my mama is real. Though. So you're just going to wash it away like it never happened. We don't understand. Part of this mystery. And how we could have Jesus in our hearts to the depths of us being transformed, but still got granddaddy in our bones to the depths of us being blind to each other, blind to a real view of God and a real full understanding of the gospel. So blind that a white slave master could do his business with his slaves and then go and be a minister. Sing songs, good old hymns, like we sang this morning. Hello. Woo. And then they say amen and go out into the courtyard and lynch some black people. And you may think, it's obviously crazy. No one does that. But do you, are you in touch with your own sin? Because your brother, on my journey, I'm still getting in touch with the depths of granddaddy's genes inside of me. Yeah. But oh, for the grace that I found in the power of forgiving, forgiveness. And this isn't like forgive and forget. (laughs) I don't know where that is. I know forgiveness is real, but forgetting is a whole nother deal. I think that helps to keep the lamenting present. It's out of lamenting that we get understanding of how to respond. But we have to first lament. Be willing to feel the pain. Get in touch with our own pain as we get in touch with the pain of others. But I can get it how it be somewhat self-incriminating for, you know, a white slave master or a wealthy person right now to be in touch with somebody else's pain when you've inflicted the pain. It's a messy journey. I want to, um, yeah, I want for you to have some time to reflect. I'm trusting this isn't your first opportunity to hear what's being shared at the conference in this workshop. I'm trusting it's not, but for those that it is, welcome to the conversation. Recently, uh, with a good brother, my good brother, (laughs) 
he, um, as we were praying and dialoguing about this, uh, introduced me to a song that's gripped my heart and keeps me in this posture of lamenting, of just feeling. Um, I believe it's part of the journey. It's part of the process that's necessary for us to truly be this new community. Because again, we can get on the, on the train for all things new. But there is something that makes the newness sweet and sweeter when I understand how bad it's been. As our brother said, when we remember, when we remember how we were cut off, when we remember the pain of folks having limbs cut off, so that this new thing, this new humanity that God has created can truly be sweet. But I have to first start with lamenting. So I want to play this song for you. And as you're listening, it may cause you to feel uncomfortable. That's a part of lamenting. It's okay. I'm going to tell you as a speaker, because I got permission and a little bit of authority. It's okay to feel uncomfortable. Yeah. The messy, it's okay. So whatever that means to any of you where you are, it's okay. The pain is not an indication that you're doing something wrong. It might be indication that you're moving in the right direction. Understand in this Ephesians book, right there in chapter 6, the Apostle Paul talks about this idea of spiritual warfare and the attack and the work of the enemy. So don't think it's strange that things are a little crazy and hard and difficult. It's a part of the reality that we're engaged in. As you're reflecting, as you listen to this music, I want you to have some practical questions to ponder. So here's what I would like for you to ponder. How has God recently been coming to you? How has God recently been coming to you? That's the first thing I want you to kind of quiet yourself and ask. And think about what circumstances people. Second would be for you to quiet yourself and think about. How might God be wanting to reveal the mystery of the gospel, a better picture of God, better picture of yourself, better picture of others. See, in all of this in our time, specifically now, my prayer is that you would have an eye-opening moment that you will, by God's spirit, have the eyes of your heart enlightened, as the apostle prayed in Ephesians. The eyes of your heart. I've had what I call these conversion moments, when the eyes of my heart just got, oh, okay. So it's not a one and done thing. Our brother Peter, as the speaker alluded to in the session, had his aha moments when the eyes of his heart, when he got it, when he got it. Oh, God's not partial. Oh, but it took him three wrestling moments with the spirit to get it. But then later, as we saw in Galatians, he had to get it again. This revealing seeing the mysteries of the gospel beyond just the gospel. How might God be revealing, pulling back the veil from your eyes to reveal more of who God is, the depth of your brokenness, blindness. We got some blind spots, right? Granted, it's deep. 
so that you might be able to see others in a very different way. I promise you, as I've worshiped and prayed and cried out to God, uh, with my eyes clenched and closed, I open them up and I look at someone and I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> what? One time at Moody, as I was a student there, I would sit oftentimes with the international students at their table, you know, because I was just like intrigued with accents, and stories, and like, this is so cool, man. Y'all are cool, man. So one day I'm leaving the table to take my tray up and I forgot something that's typical of me. And I look back at the table that I just left and I saw for one of the first times. They were all from European countries, but I saw five different looking white folk. <laughs> I know it sounds weird, right? But I'm looking at them like and I stood there in my way of doing what? Y'all look different. And they looked back at me. Yes, Dante. <laughs> okay. My eyes. My point is my eyes. As I listened to their stories and got to hurt and feel with some of them and what they were going through with the uncomfortability of being in this majority white campus, but we're not really white, but we are. But I'm hearing all this. My heart began to be pricked. God was revealing more, more, so I could see more. So how might God be revealing more, more of the mystery of the gospel? Sweet Spirit, go with us now. And as we leave this place, but never your presence, may we be mindful of this work, this ongoing work of reconciliation, the spiritual process that requires repentance forgiveness and justice to restore broken relationships and systems to the place that you intended them to be. Give us courage to be ambassadors of this ministry that you've given us and we'll be careful with humble hearts to say thank you. In Jesus' name, we're praying with great expectation. And if you agree, say amen. God bless you. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Gospel Coalition podcast. Check out more gospel-centered resources at thegospelcoalition.org.